Welcome to another Think Your Way to an Epic Life podcast. Today is going to be a little different, kind of special. Uh, I have a friend of mine that's here who's, who's him and his wife are coaching clients of mine. And we're not going to talk about real estate, even though they have an amazing team. They, they, are, they do a great job. We're actually going to talk about his experiences um, and he's going to do a much better job of explaining it to you than I will. But uh, Chris Cavanaugh, if you know him, you love him. He's just one of these wonderful people that you really enjoy getting to know. And he's had an experience where he actually got to visit heaven. So we're going to get to talk to him about that. He's willing to open up to us. Um, and I hope that you take away something really special from this. Chris, thanks for coming. Absolutely, Kara. I appreciate you having me on. And um, I am excited to share. It's taken me some time to kind of process through the things that have happened uh, in my life. But um, I'm at a place. I'm really good and, and glad to share it to help others in, in uh, any way that it can touch them. So, Well, I want to start kind of at the beginning. Like, <clears throat> where, where were you born, raised? What was childhood like for you? Just a kind of a quick overview. Sure. Uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. Um, I was raised by my mom primarily. I had a stepdad. Uh, grew up in a tough part of town. Um, had four four brothers. Uh, we were all kind of spread out in age, and and um, I lived anyway. Lived there. Moved out when I was fourteen. Got a hardship license and started working on my own, and got my own place. And uh, kind of went from there uh, in life. Can I interrupt you just for a second? Sure. You were fourteen years old. Fourteen years old. Yeah. And you went out on your <clears throat> own and made a life for yourself. I did. I did. I, I lost a, a really good friend of mine. Um, he wasn't a gang member. We're sitting on a curb and he got shot and uh, from a uh, gang shooting that broke out at the, the park across the street from my house. And uh, that was my cue. Uh, we waited an hour and a half for ambulances to get there and, and uh, police. It's just how response times work in the wards in Houston. And um, and uh, that was my cue to to. I need to I need to get out of here. Um, and most of the people I knew were either using drugs or selling drugs or or you know um, uh, getting into gang violence because they didn't have that support at home and then they didn't have that home structure and all those negative influences were literally right at the doorstep uh, in the community I grew up in. So yeah, I love my mom to death. She's my heart. God bless her soul in heaven. Um, uh, but yeah, I had to leave. And so I had to, I always say it wasn't my girlfriend. It was just a girl that was a friend who was 18 and could sign the lease. And I said, I'll pay the bills if you sign the lease and, and, and started working. Yeah. Still going to school full time. Uh, I was a, a 4.0 student and, um, I worked immediately after school and, and worked till late into the evening and then back to school the next morning. So, yeah. Wow. So all of the success that you now enjoy, Mm -hmm. um, didn't just happen by luck. No, no, I, I, I wasn't, none of it was given to me. It's okay for those that it is, but, uh, I've, I've earned my way to where I am. Hard work, blood, sweat, tears, lessons learned. <laughs> Shoo. So. Literal blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. Literally. Wow. Literally. Okay. So what, a, what <clears throat> a, a crazy start to life. Yeah. So did you graduate high school? I did graduate high school. I was in the top 5% of my class. Shoo. Um, I did uh, in my senior year, and that's kind of a whole another uh, tangent I'm glad to talk about, but it won't go off on today. But um, I had gotten in trouble my senior year with drugs and lost my full ride to University of Texas. So I had earned a full ride to University of Texas and lost it um, my senior year. So that was kind of tough. That was, that was really tough. Um, but I will say... Um, Going to prison uh, right after that at such a young age and uh, getting out was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me. It could have been the worst. Um, it's tough to go into the system and come out and, and survive. Um, but I paroled out at two years. Uh, I was just about turned 20 when I got out. And uh, I... I uh, I spent every day with a with a counselor or a life coach, if you will, um, every single day I met with him for the first six months wow. I was out. And I wanted him to call me on my stuff. I, I wanted to stay away from the same people, places, things that got me into trouble. And I wanted to live a good life. I knew, I knew laying in that prison bed every night sitting up because I was afraid to lay down, right, um, was not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. So, golly, I can't even imagine. 
Yeah. I, that is, is just... A bit crazy. <laughs> well, I also recently interviewed... Um, did you watch the podcast with Wings for Life? Oh, I didn't. No. Okay, you'll find that very interesting because they help prisoners and families of prisoners. Ooh. And the reality of someone going in and getting out and, and doing what you've done, the odds of it are astronomically not in your favor. They aren't. So, right. so what, what I'm going to listen to that podcast now, cause it might be something I'm interested in. Oh, I guarantee you getting involved with, you will, you will definitely want to get involved. Yeah. I did a, prison ministry in, in Texas <laughs> until I moved here at age 28. And that was, I did drug out al alcohol and, uh, um, drug and alcohol sponsoring of over a hundred individuals in my twenties. Um, my coach said, if you are life, I call them coaches now, not counselors, but uh, my, my coach at the time told me, he said, if you want to stay out of trouble, you're going to have to stay helping people who are. And so I learned at a really young age, the power of giving back the selfish power of it. And also the, the powerful impact you can have in people's lives and, and helping them. And, and a very small few of those individuals that I sponsored, uh, did clean up and are still living productive lives and are, are still tell me how appreciative they are. Right. Um, yeah. So, gosh, the odds are very slim though. They are slim. They're very slim <clears throat> and, and, and it's tough. I mean, addiction, you know, and, and, and things, addiction is a life problem. It, most of the time it's not, I mean, the harder drugs, cocaine and heroin are absolutely physically addicting, but the main addiction with any, or the main problem with any addiction is, is life problems and not being able to live life on life's terms and and feeling like all the power and all the weight in the world falls on you, you know, and really identifying with. I mean, and I, I've genuinely had sponsees that, that the doorknob, they just could not admit that there was a higher power out there. They just could not connect with God or with a religion or, you know, or with a faith. And I said, look, it doesn't really matter. You just have to pick something, right? That is, and I know it may sound crazy, a doorknob, but the, the doorknob faith guy is now a, a very uh, faithful, God-fearing Christian. Um, and he's one of the few that, that have cleaned up and, and lived a very productive life. Um, so, yeah. so, so what do you think the importance of helping others to stay clean yourself is? It's a constant, one, anytime you teach, you learn. Sometimes you learn more than others. Um, and it's a reminder because we as humans are so selective with our memory. You know, drugs and alcohol or whatever can destroy your life. You can be at the absolute bottom and you just barely get back on your feet. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't that bad. You know, I can drink a beer, right? I can, I can do, I can do these things. And, and so it really, it really is um, a life problem and giving back to people and, and realizing that on a daily basis helps you to stay on track with your goals. Similar in real estate, right? Helping others in real estate sharpens my own saw, um, helps me to cut that tree down faster, you know, and, and, and grow, right? Yeah. And, and synergize with others. So. There you go. Okay, so <clears throat> that was your high school world. Now tell me your work world up till now. Uh, my work world, I um, I worked in restaurants initially, uh, worked up to being a general manager for Bennigan's at um, age 21, and I was recruited from there. Thought that's what I was going to do. I was so proud of myself. I was the youngest GM for uh, Steak and El Ponderosa Group in the U.S. ever at that time. And um, I don't even know that they're in business anymore. Uh, I know Bennigan's isn't, but um, got recruited from there, went into the retail space um, and multi-store management, worked my way. At, they, they only hired as an assistant manager, which I was offended the first six months. <laughs> You're asking me to go from a GM to an assistant manager of a mall store? No way. Um, but after a while, and I, I really started to trust this gentleman and, and his faith in me and and I said, all right, I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm very happy where I'm at. And, and sure enough, got my own store in two weeks and, and worked my way up to area manager and, and district and then regional. And um, that's what brought me to New Mexico was multi-store management, um, over 300 units that I was managing. Uh, overall, obviously, I had a massive team of people that, that did that, you know, from Canada to Mexico and Central U.S. But 
Um, and then from there, I, I had a spine injury in 08 after I moved here, right here on Sandia Mountain, and uh, put me in a wheelchair um, for just under five years. And uh, uh, that was a shift for me. That was a big, a big life shift for me. And people, when I tell that story, the initial reaction is pity. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not talking about it out of pity. It was like one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. And they're like, huh? Like, how does that even work? And I'm like, look, I, I always say I met my kids in the wheelchair. Because I, I worked so hard. And my definition of being a good parent was providing. And I was providing at a very high level. At that time, I was making great money, but the planes, trains, and automobiles, that was me. I was traveling five out of six weeks um, and uh, loved what I did. I was very passionate. I did the same thing then that I do now as helping people live successful lives and, and grow their professional careers. And that was a passion for me at that time and still is. Um, so, uh, but, but in that, I also met Carmen. So you happen to know my remarkable wife. I love her to pieces, and uh, she inspires me every day, every morning when I wake up. And I'm very thankful to have her, but I would have never met her, right? I would have never met her. And uh, so I'm just super appreciative of, of that happening. And so as I was getting out of the wheelchair, I was trying to find, or actually while I was in the wheelchair, I'm like, what am I going to do professionally? I could have stayed on disability. I had third party and social security lifetime disability without having to reapply or anything because of my injuries. And when the doctors told me <laughs> after the seven surgeries, like, you just need, I'd always come in like, all right, what's next doc, right? What are we doing next? And, and they said, we really need to start looking at, you know, getting used to your limitations, right? We've, we've done everything we can. You're standing up straight now instead of curved looking at the floor. Um, and I didn't like that. <laughs> I, did, <clears throat> I didn't like that. I went home. I didn't say anything to him then. I was like, okay. And, and I went home and, and, and I was sitting there by myself. And I remember figur figuratively getting on my knees and just saying, Lord, like, if you give me my legs back, I will never say no again to serving. You ask, I'll serve. I just want my legs back. I, I don't want to be in this wheelchair. I don't want to be on disability. And was it easy? Faith without works is dead, right? And that's my firm belief. Like, all the faith in the world is necessary, but you have to put in the work. And it was a lot of hard work getting myself back up on my feet. And um, it was a lot of challenges. Uh, very tough. I was going through a divorce at the time from my kid's wife. And um, I won't go into the details of why that happened, but some things happened while I was in the ICU and, and, and I, we just couldn't get past it. So um, uh, I had two beautiful kids out of that marriage. And, and, uh, uh, but it was tough. It, it, it was a tough, a tough struggle. Um, you know, it was getting out of the, the wheelchair, you know, onto the toilet, getting from the door of the bathroom to the toilet, right? Getting from my recliner to the bathroom, right? Getting from my recliner to the kitchen, getting to the front door, getting down to the end of the driveway, getting to the mailbox at the end of the street, getting 200 yards, 300 yards. And it was literally, that was the step. And that, 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 those were the baby steps. And so goes life, right? You eat it one elephant at a time or one bite at a time. <laughs> you eat an elephant one bite at a time. You know what I mean? Um, and so uh, I, I, I think that is such an important lesson that a lot of us never learn, right? We get scared. We try. We, we have what we consider a failure or a setback, and we quit. We're like, it's just not going to happen. And, and again, you eat that elephant one bite at a time. Just keep doing the right things. Keep looking forward. Keep taking one more step. And for me at that time in my life, it was literally steps physical steps. Um, and now in life, it's it's baby steps and all kinds of things, you know, in my marriage with my kids and my job and my career and giving back like my passion to build a youth retreat center, right? I wanted that to be done three years ago, right? That was my goal. It's going to be built in the East Mountains. We we're going to self-fund it. And, and that's still my goal, right? Because I, I, I don't, it's just learning experiences and stepping stones. And hey, I need more money than what I thought to do that. <laughs> so yeah, but I kind of got off track there a little bit. No, you're, do, you're doing great. So, so you had this experience where you couldn't walk for how many years? Five um, years? Uh, going on five, like a total five to where I'd say I was up on a cane or walking without any, without a wheelchair, without a walker. 
Um, three, the first three years were surgeries. So I really couldn't, really couldn't do anything at that point. I was stuck in the chair. Um, and, and so about two years, a two year process to get on my feet. Part of that was committing to losing weight because I had gained, I was immobile. My legs were lethargic. I had doubled my weight. So more than double my weight, I think it was like 170 whenever I had my accident. And I was 365 when I started the weight loss journey um, after my last surgery. And uh, it was uh, the most unhealthy diet, right? Um, no nutritionist told me to do this. Uh, I just said, I didn't even, I'd never even eaten edamame, right? Or soybean. And I just looked online and said, what fills you up? But doesn't, but doesn't cause you to gain weight, and something about soybeans came up. I said, all right, fine, I'm just going to eat soybeans. And I took myself to the grocery <laughs> store, and I filled my grocery cart up with frozen bags of 8-ounce edamame. And I ate that three times a day and drank water for 12 months. And that's all I had to eat. I didn't need a lot of energy because I was in a wheelchair. So I didn't, my brain didn't need a lot of food because I wasn't working. Um, but I lost 128 pounds that year. Uh, to the day. I didn't cheat once. I think it's the first time in my entire life still to date that I never cheated on my diet. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I cheat on my diet all the time uh, nowadays. But um, that got the weight off so that I could start, I could really fulfill that journey of getting back on my feet. Whew. Wow. Yeah. That's just overwhelming. Yeah. It's uh, a fun story that you told me, if you don't mind retelling here, about your first date with your lovely bride. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that that's a that's a that, good that one. ties right into whole, your your. I, are you talking about uh, how how <laughs> the most expensive first date part of it? No, no, no. Where okay. she, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so uh, me and Carmen met on eHarmony, and um, I I she was the only person I actually winked at. Right, my parents, uh, my my dad, my mom had already passed away. My dad and uh, one of my brothers bought the account for me for Christmas um, in 2012. Funny part is Carmen's mom. Uh, got the account for her wow. at the beginning of 2013 in January. So it's kind of interesting. It's really God. Some things you can't deny, right? At right. least I can't. Right. Um, and <laughs> so we talk like teenagers every night, you know, until two in the morning. And and uh, our first date was on April 5th of 2013. And um, the week before, she had told me that she was going to serve at a George Strait concert. Like she was going to be working at one of the barbecue places or something uh at the at the concert and and they they canceled her spot to help last minute and so she was frustrated and I said well would you like to go to George Strait I love George Strait right I grew up in Houston I love country music and uh and she said yeah wh why I was like well I'll get us some tickets she's like are you sure and I said yeah so anyway I got tickets that's a whole other story I spent a, a lot of money on those tickets after I committed <laughs> um <laughs> So we met at we met at Seasons down in Old Town, had a few drinks, and uh, beforehand, I always say I passed the first date of the or the first part of the first date, um, and and so after that we went to a George Strait concert, and and I remember before I went into Seasons, I had my cane right there in my car, and it, it's sad because she wouldn't have cared if I had a cane or not, but at the time I'm like, man, I really don't want to use a cane on this first date, like I hadn't dated in 14 years, right? <laughs> And so, um, and so, so I, I, I said, I'm just going to do it. So I walked in the seasons. Thank God they had an elevator. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, so I took the elevator up to the second floor. We, we had our meal. Um, I still remember exactly what she was wearing when she walked on the patio. She was late. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, anyway, so we went to a George Strait concert after, and, and it was at the pit. And I was doing good with my pain, man. I really was. And and when we went to leave and I went to stand up, I was not okay with my pain. And uh, it was pretty bad. And I'm, like, looking around for who I'm going to ask for, for, you know, assistance or a wheelchair to get me out of there. And we kind of get up out of our seat, and, and I'm walking behind her, and I'm, like, holding that rail, you know, like no other. And, and we, got, we got up to the top for the seating area, and I just did it. I just put my arm around her and just held on. <laughs> I mean, I was leaning on her, Kara. I, I wasn't like a soft touch, you know, behind the shoulder blade. Like, I was hanging on. And I felt every bit of Carmen's eyes on me. Like, what is this guy thinking? First date, he's hanging all over me in front of all these people. This isn't going to work out, you know. 
and and I could I could feel her eyes, and we we walked all the way down. And, and later, it was about it was about our sixth or seventh date um, that I pulled up at her house, and I was like, "Hey, like my back's really hurting. Do you mind if I use a cane?" And she said, "Have you not been using a cane because of me? That's just stupid." <laughs> <laughs> and so so anyway, yeah. So that was that story. Oh, um, that's adorable. Yeah, yeah. Very it's, cool. And it's been and it's been an awesome ride ever since. So. Absolutely. And it's going to keep getting better. Amen. It's going to keep getting better. Okay. Amen. So now that that's basically your career. You had that act. You had that one accident. Then you had something else happen. What was that? That, um, uh, with, with the COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd gotten into real estate and it was kind of happenstance for investing and, and that's not the story for today. <laughs> um, and on March, I was a heavy smoker. I was, right? Like I have to take accountability for my own part in it. Um, but I, I got COVID. I went to bed at around 8.30 on, on March 28th of 2013 and uh, woke up about 45 minutes later. Wait, and, 2013? And, oh, sorry. 2020. Okay. <laughs> Fast forward seven years of 2020. And, uh, and, and I don't remember anything from the week before or that night. So just to be clear, like I, the story I tell is based on what Carmen has told me um, and what I've learned from clients that had meetings with and stuff before that happened. Um, but anyway, Carmen, I woke up. She said I was coughing like crazy, went out in the backyard, was was uh, just all over the place. And she, like, waking up, coming out, like, what are you doing, you know? And she said I was sitting on the back bed of my truck just coughing profusely and couldn't stop. She made me come inside and she took my feet, my temperature and I was 104.1 uh, temperature. And when she said it, she said, I immediately started freaking out. And I was like, get away from me. I don't want to get you sick. No, I can't get you sick. And I don't remember any of this. She said it was like an act of Congress to get me in the car. Uh, but she got me in the car. She took me to Russ Medical Center. And I, I, I remember vaguely like all the doctors coming in. Right. And I don't remember getting there very much, but I do remember all the, like one doctor and then all of a sudden all these, it was two or three and then it was four or five and they all had concerned looks on their faces and they're not looking at me. They're looking at the monitors and, and, and a nurse came up to me and she grabbed my hand and she said, I can tell you're a person of faith because you're praying the rosary. Uh, she said, you're in great hands. We'll see you on the other side. And she put me to sleep and, and, uh, I was in a medicated coma for three and a half weeks. Um, it was very dark for me. Like I know some people say they, they don't remember at all. And I've seen some, some things on the news, but I can tell you for me, like it was, I lived every moment of that. I lived like an alternate reality completely. Uh, when I woke up in late April, I thought I was in a hospital. Carmen wasn't there. That was when family wasn't allowed to come visit you. Um, and I had COVID, so they definitely wouldn't have been able to come in. And, um, and I thought I was in a hospital in New York. And I, and, and I won't go too much into that story. I just say that because it was just crazy. And it wasn't until they moved me downstairs. I thought I was a cowboy, a professional cowboy for a living. Like when I first, the, the, um, the, physic, the, the therapist, I don't know if she was occupational speech or physical. I don't remember. Uh, but she, they, they lifted me up and they got me in a chair. I couldn't walk. I couldn't move my legs or open my hands or anything, which I didn't realize at that time. I had just woken up. And she asked me, so tell me a little bit about your life. What do you do for a living? You know, and I said, <laughs> or she said, do you have, are you married? And I, and I said, yeah, I'm married. And what's your wife's name? Carmen. And, and I remembered that. And she asked me if I had kids. And I said, yeah, I have four. I have Dylan, Sebastian, Chloe, and Heather's the question mark because we don't have a fourth kid. And I don't, never wanted to name a child Heather. <laughs> um, so that was kind of a joke. And it's a joke now that I thought I had four kids. And then she asked me what I, she was asking me questions about my, my career. And I couldn't, I remember not being able to remember. And so I just, I just said what I said. And I said, I'm from Houston. I'm a cowboy, of course. And she kind of chuckled and she said, okay, cowboy. She said, and tell me a little bit about your house. And I couldn't remember what my house even looked like. I was just, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember. It was one story, two story. Um, I couldn't remember what it looked like. I just couldn't. I'm like, you know, honestly, like I'm drawing a blank. I don't know. 
And, and she said, do you remember your wife's phone number? And I said, and I did. <laughs> and so we called Carmen, and, or she called Carmen, and she was telling Carmen, so I know your husband's a professional cowboy, and I just heard Carmen <laughs> laughing through the phone. He is not a professional cowboy. He is a real estate broker. The closest he's gotten to being a cowboy is riding our inflatable PBR bull in the pool. <laughs> and, and so we kind of laughed. But... Um, but but going back, like I, I thought I was in Rio Rancho. When they sent me downstairs, I called Carmen and I said, and they had to help me. I couldn't dial with my knuckles. I, I was so frustrated. But they finally helped me call her. And I was like, please don't come to New York. I, uh, people are dying out here. It's horrible. And and uh, she's like, honey, like you're at the Russ Hospital in Rio Rancho, New York. And I'm like, when did they move me? When I was in a coma? <laughs> And she said, no, you were never in New York. Like, where did that come from? And I was baffled. Like, it still took me a couple weeks to believe I wasn't in New York, but, uh, or how that happened. So I lived a very alternate reality and that was tough. Like the five weeks after I went home, I had to learn how to walk again. I had to, which that was just, I can't even talk, like uh, express the emotions after what I'd already been through with not being able to walk. I, I was, uh, I was in a bad, bad place and, and I had a great support system. Um, I had to learn how to use my hands again. Like I couldn't, I was looking at my hands, telling them to open my fingers, but they wouldn't open. And so I had a, a five days a week, I had three different therapists come and see me, a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, and a physical therapist. And, and we did that for five weeks. And Carmen was like a drug dealer running around with both cell phones, mine and hers running the real estate business. And she would not let me have it. And I would always, I would ask and she's like, nope. And I wasn't in the right mind to do real estate for somebody anyway. So, um, yeah, but that was my, that was my first, uh, experience in the hospital and nothing about that was, was good, right? That first time. And, and it was, it was still really rough the, the, in, in 2021 when I went, went back after getting my, my Moderna shot. Um, but that's when I had a, a really awesome, awesome experience. So, all right. So this experience was really a negative experience. All of it was negative. It was very dark for you. Do you remember anything from the while you were in the con- in the concussion, in the coma, <laughs> in the coma? I do. I I, I remember. Um, it was very like I don't know. I don't know how to explain it other than just crazy and very 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 dark. Um, and I would I just I, I felt like I was dying over and over and over and over and over again, and I was screaming through it. I was fighting it, and physically, I learned later that that like I was fighting it. I was screaming in my sleep in the hospital. Um, they they told Carmen that they had to put me on more medication than they've had to put on anybody on in a medicated coma in a very very long time to get me to at least somewhat. Uh, like rest and not be physically fighting. I was ripping the tubes out. They said they had to strap me down to the bed in eight places. They started with just my wrist. They had to strap my thighs, my ankles, my, my forearms by my elbows. And I, and I, when I woke up, I, I didn't realize, but one of the nurses downstairs had pointed out to me, she's like, gosh, what happened? Were you in a car accident? And I was like, no, why would you say that? And she's like, well, you just have scabs all over. And so I turned over my hands, and that was the first time I'd been awake about eight days that I even really looked at it because I kept looking at my hands like this because my fingers wouldn't open. And the backsides of my hands were completely scabbed all the way across from just fighting against the bedside. My elbows, the backside of my arms were just scabbed over. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that was very interesting to me that, like, how the reality of what was going on with me physically, you know, uh, here, it, it did tie into what I was experiencing. I, I genuinely was just fighting, dying over and over. And the, and the doctor said, you should have died three times over, right? No one carries that low of an oxygen content for 10 days and lives. What was your oxygen content? Um, below 70% for 10 days. And they the oxygen, that's why they had to intubate me, because the oxygen they had me on was the equivalent of sitting on the hood of a car going 80 miles an hour, and my lungs weren't absorbing oxygen. Um, and I had a fever over 102 for that same amount of time. So that for multiple reasons, they said I, I should have suffered a lot of brain damage, uh, at best. Right. And, uh, so I'm very blessed. Like I, I didn't, you know, and I, I have my full mental faculties back. I blame 
my memory sometimes on COVID, but <laughs> <laughs> Carmen says it was there before. So <laughs> um, she, she's my sounding board all the time. Uh, yeah, so it, it was it was uh, very dark, and, and and I guess I know I've said that. And I it really was a don't. battle. It was a battle, um, and and it it was, um, and I did like I I left the hospital in New York. I thought they released me, and I walked out into the streets, and they were empty, and I had nothing in my pockets. I didn't have a cell phone. I couldn't call Carmen. I had no way of getting a hold of her. I didn't know where she was. I wandered the streets of New York for days. Um, aw- to me, awake, right, awake. And, and there were people in the city and people were dying. It was very, it was, it was very, it was very dark. And I, (laughs) I finally asked someone if I could please just stay in their, their apartment. And it was a Chinese, I know this is so absurd. It was a Chinese couple and, and, and Carmen always makes a joke that I was doing real estate, even in my medicated (laughs) coma, I was subletting an apartment (laughs) and negotiating a a place to sleep Uh. in New York. And, and, um, and, and then I went back to the hospital, and it, it was just crazy, but um, in my sleep. And then I woke up. Right? But and this is all as real to you as I'm oh, sitting was, here right now. Oh, it was so real that when I woke up, I genuinely thought I was in a hospital in New York. Like, I, I, there wasn't a part of me that thought I wasn't. And for Carmen, Carmen had to, even after I got home, uh, probably up to, like, the week before I went back to work, she would still, like, I'm talking to people or telling the story or, or talking about, you know, what I went through. She's like... Like, no, 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 that, that didn't happen either, honey. I'm like, oh, it didn't. And so I just had to trust her because I, 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 it was like living something and then having someone tell you you didn't and, and it really didn't happen. And, and, um, yeah. Yeah. so. So, So how did you come out of that? I mean, not, not literally how did you come out, but, but who did you come out of that when you came out of the dark? I know you had a lot of help. Yeah. Who, who really, you don't have to give names if you don't want to, but sure. but who really stood out during that really dark time as a beacon of light for you, other than of course your lovely bride? Um, that was that was the tough God. I mean, that was the tough part for me. I I didn't know anybody that I could relate to, and. Like the story I just told, I absolutely wasn't comfortable saying to anybody but like family or around Carmen and my kids, um, especially once I realized I didn't know what I was talking about. Um, and I I, uh, I tried doing it on my own. I genuinely did inside. Like, I'm just going to be better. That's how I've always been in life, you know. Lack of better word, it happens. And uh, get on with it. Find the silver lining. What am I supposed to learn and go? And and so that's what I that's what I was trying to do, and that's why I was trying to go back to work because that was something I wanted to attach to, and I'm glad that Carmen didn't allow that. But it was it was uh, I would say the first six months um, were very very difficult for me from a, a nightmare perspective, from uh, night terrors, um, flashbacks, um, fear. I, I've later learned that the reason why every time I went to my spine doctor or doctor's appointment after that, my heartbeat was 130 beats per minute. My blood pressure was out the roof. Um, and I was checking those things at home. So I knew they weren't problematic, but like they were wanting to admit me into the hospital. They're like, this is not healthy. Like, let's take it again. Let's take it again. And I realized that like hospitals were a trigger for me, even if I drove by them. It just triggered the subconscious, you know, and now what I know from, you know, really learning and starting to learn about NLP and neuro-linguistic programming is that, like, those triggers will will gestalt to every negative medical thing you've ever had in your life, you know, And, and the feelings from those events. And so the the trauma I felt from almost dying from COVID, like every time that was triggered, it brought back the feelings and the emotions and the fears from my, my spine injury and from almost dying on the mountain. I mean, I was life lighted. I was in ICU for three, it was in the hospital three months, ICU half that time when I, when I hurt my back. And so I almost died then too. I was lucky to live. It was a blessing that I even made it to the hospital. 
they used a little air breather. And so it kind of just tied those things to me. So I, I know I didn't answer your question. Really, nobody. I, I, I tried going to counseling, but at that time and still today, you call for a trauma therapist and we can get you in in six months. Wow. We can get you in in six months. And uh, the facilitator at press had said I really needed to do something called, uh, it's, and I don't remember, it's like uh, uh, the electronic uh the uh, ERT, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a, a specific type of therapy to deal with trauma. They use lights and little things you hold in your hands, and I can't remember the name of it. But um, and and those those were you couldn't even book. They had full caseloads. I called everybody on my insurance. I called everybody off my insurance. I called everybody. No one could get me in, and so I gave up and I went back to I'm just going to handle this myself. And it was hard for Carmen. It was hard for my kids because. I was different. I, was, I wasn't different to the world. I was smiling face on. I learned to practice um, looking like I was super happy, not in pain from my back injury. Because uh, if I wanted to be a professional, I could not go around with that look on my face all the time. And so I learned that, and I just put that right back into play and in the world. But when I came home... Um, and I wasn't ugly, and, 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 and there, you know, I had anger issues and uh, quick, like my, I, I, it's just, it was, a, it was a tough six months. And I, and I didn't know who to turn to, and that's scary, right? Like, because I know I'm not the only person. I know there's thousands of other people in, in our state alone that have gone through something different but similar and needing someone to speak with professionally and couldn't get it. Hmm. And in America, we had the best medical system in the world. We're number but, 19. Oh, are we number 19? Good. Because <laughs> I, I couldn't stand to say we're number one. <laughs> yeah. No. no. So number 19. Okay, good. That makes yeah. sense. We're number one on a lot, but, but not, not, that. not in medical. So, not in medical. yeah. Cool. But our medical system has you still alive after it does. two times that you shouldn't have been. Mm hmm. Now let's go to the third time. Third time's a charm, right? Yeah, third time's a charm. Um, and, and I want to tell a little bit leading oh, up to that. Do. And, yes. and that, that before going into the hospital, I quit smoking for a little bit after my, my first near death in the hospital, but then I started again, right? It was a coping mechanism for me. It was a crutch, but it was a coping mechanism. And I went right back to smoking. And I remember, and, and I, I didn't take it easy, like we, we were off to the races, right, with our business. We've been very, very blessed to have massive increases each year, even through all that. And uh, our team is amazing both years, including my wife, um, and handling that. And, and I'm, I'll forever be grateful for KW. Um, I, this isn't a KW thing, but I'm going to drop it here. Uh, KW, and I still tear up about it, KW stepped up in a way with my family that I'm forever in debt. And I've told Jake in leadership, whatever you need, I won't say no. I won't say no, because I wouldn't say no to my family, and, and this is my family. Yeah. Yeah. They brought hot meals to my kids. Um, while Carmen's having to run our thriving real estate firm and trying to hold it together, visit me at, at the hospital because she could go this time. And, and she said it was hard because she couldn't go the first time. It was even harder because she could go. Right. Because she could see me. Right. And it was worse. Than, it was everything she was hoping it wasn't and more. Right. Um, but I was. I was smoking and, 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 and oh, KW, they... They, they dropped off hot meals to my family they, every day. They raised like 30, and, and we didn't need money. Like that, it wasn't the money, it was the motion and the action. The people who reached out and offered support and help and took over listing negotiations. Evan Schuster did that for us. Kristen Apodaca stepped in and helped out in a big way. And, uh, and, and that just means the world to me. Um, but I, I, uh, I was smoking leading up to, and in and, and the beginning of 2021, I remember we set these really bold goals, and, and I hit the ground running and, and didn't stop. I wasn't taking care of myself. I, 
And the thought in my head, as sick as it is, is, man, I almost died, and I, I do not have my family, from a wealth perspective, set up to be taken care of the way they deserve to be. And, and that was my motivation for not, <laughs> I know it sounds sick, working so freaking hard, and, and as a side effect, not taking care of myself. And uh, I went and got my, my first Moderna shot the first week of April, of 2021 and, and Moderna is a vaccine, oh. a vaccine for COVID. For COVID. Okay. And, uh, and I, I, um, I slept the whole day. I, we were supposed to go to Santa Fe. We had family in town for that one. And I, I, we came home and I just need to take a quick nap, you know, and I slept, I woke up the next day over 24 hours later, but Carmen said I was delirious. I was breathing weird, but I don't remember any of that. I just slept. And, and then I was back on my feet, so I did the second shot. And I had apprehension about the second shot. And I even told Carmen, I was like, man, like, is it bad that, like, I don't want to do the second shot? And she, and she supported me. She said, if you have a gut feeling telling you not to do it, then don't do it. If, you, if your reasons outweigh that, that's your call, right? And so I waited a few more days, and I said, yeah, I'm just going to go get it. This is just my fear. This is my PTSD from last year. You know, this is... And I, I talked to myself into getting it. And um, I got the shot that uh, that evening. I started running low-grade fever. And here I go, you know, laying in the backseat. My, um, my son, Sebastian, was going off to boot camp for Army Reserves. And that weekend that was coming up, we were going to the lake. to. That's what he wanted to do his last weekend, go fishing. He loves to fish, <laughs> and I, uh, and and we went, and and it just got worse. I mean, I started coughing, and the fever got worse, and it got to the point where I couldn't breathe at all unless I laid on my right side. Like I literally stopped breathing because I couldn't stop coughing. Like it was so outwardly and not inwardly that like Carmen's mom. Thank God Carmen's mom was there. She's uh, she's been a home health care uh, provider for a good portion of her life. And, and she, she took great care of me, her and Carmen and my family. And, and we just had make, they made the call. They're like, I'm like, no, let's not. This is Bastion Sweet. And they said, we're going. And so they had to get me into the truck. I had to lay on my side in the truck all the way from Elephant Butte Lake. And we had the deck boat behind it. I remember um, saying, just, let's just go home, get the boat unhooked as I'm like gasping for air. And, Carmen will tell you she generally thought I, I died a couple times and stopped breathing a few times on the way home. And she had to, like, shake me, and I took a deep breath in. And, and uh, she's like, we're going straight to the hospital. So here we are, my dually in a 24-foot deck boat pulling up, you know, at Russ, Russ Medical Center again. And, and um, I was there, uh, I, it was about 10 hours, and and – same process though they were they just kept pushing more oxygen in and and uh, they couldn't figure out what was going on because like there were other things going on and and in my body and and then they finally came in and i told them when i came in uh, i said i will not go in a medicated coma i will not do a medicated coma i will not be intubated i won't and so they had to call carmen because i could no longer talk anymore um i couldn't I wasn't getting the oxygen I need. They were shoving it down me, and I, and I couldn't talk anymore. And Carmen said she showed up, and, and or they called her and said, we need you here now. We need you to sign off. Your husband's in bad shape, and he has instructed us not to intubate. And so we can't um, unless you say different. And and so I remember her looking at me. I was awake. I just I couldn't talk. I just was I was done. <laughs> and And she said absolutely intubate him right and and she said i shook my head a little bit and and he and the doctor said that was good enough and they brought the whole team in and i was i was intubated and medicated coma within like 20 minutes um and i stayed that way for about two and a half weeks and uh i wish i could say it wasn't any darker than it was the first time you know um for the first two weeks and and I, uh, Carmen, Carmen said, and the doctor said it was so much worse. Like my fighting, it was so much worse than the last time. 
And the doctor had told her, she said, he said, you may not realize this, but I saw your husband's records. And he absolutely has to have PTSD from what happened last year. And now he's got PTSD on top of PTSD, subconsciously. And he's fighting. He's fighting. And so same thing, they had strapped me down in the works. And from Carmen or the world's perspective, they took me off the medications uh, after the two weeks when my lungs got better and started holding oxygen, and I didn't wake up. I didn't wake up. And they were worried I had brain damage. And that's what Carmen and I cry because... That's what Chief had to feel um, when they moved me downtown and to the, the neurology department, their chief neurology department for press in New Mexico. And uh, thank God they ran a brain scan and they said, and some other tests, and they came out and told her, um, he's, he, his brain's working, it's extremely active, he's somewhere, he's just not here. And that gave her a lot of relief, thank God. And, and so looking back now, because the first thing I said to Carmen when I woke up at Press Downtown was, where's my mom? And she said, honey, your mom's not here. You are at Russ Downtown. You had to be medicated. I didn't remember anything. I was like, I, I, was, I was a basket kid. I was outside of my mind, like literally. And they had to give me all kinds of medications because I was, I was hysterical. Like I, she said that, um, she said she came back into the room five minutes later. She said she was gonna go talk to the doctors, come back in. And she said, I was asking her, why are all the gravestones behind me like this? And I don't remember any of this. This is what Carmen had to tell me. And it kind of tells you how dark it was. Like, I mean, I, I was, but, but there came a point, and it, and it was almost, almost instantaneously in what I was experiencing. And I went from that dark to just at peace, like almost, almost instantly. And, and I was hanging out with, and I didn't realize, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm in this, right? I'm living this. And so I... I I didn't realize that there was something weird about the fact that I was having, I was breaking bread with my mom and my grandmother and Carmen's grandmother, who was speaking English. And I later telling the story was like, she never spoke a word of English in her entire life. She's a primary Spanish speaker, but they breaking bread and getting along and having fun and laughing. And and I was laughing with them and, and I was just living it up. I was living it up. So you went from the dark to that, just like that. It was, yep. you've got gravestones and now you're sitting with your family breaking bread. Sitting with my family. I just felt light and I was, I was, and, and again, I, my, my memories and it maybe it was, again, I'm, I'm in, I'm in a coma, right? So time there is different, <laughs> but, but I went shopping with my mom and Carmen's grandma. I had fun laughing my dad was there, my biological father, who definitely didn't get along with my grandparents and, and had a really, and did not get along with my mom, like my biological father. And they were all getting along and laughing. And, and, and it was like nothing was wrong in the world. And we went shopping. I mean, I remember going to Target with Carmen's mom, grandma and my mom, and we were having fun and shopping and, and just living it was like we were literally just living. Like I as real as I'm talking to you right now. And and I journaled all this after the fact because I was so afraid I'd forget it, you know. I probably should have gone and read it before I came and met with you, um, to remind myself of all the details. But um heaven's beautiful. And I have no fear of dying. I don't. I, I do have fear of le- leaving my family, you know, naturally, like my wife and my kids, and I love my life. Um, but I'm also a big faith person, and, and I get it now. Like, you'll be reunited with those you love when you pass away. 
I'm here to tell you that's real. It's real. It's very real. And uh, it was hard for me to get over the fact that my mom wasn't alive. You know, even after I got out of the hospital, I was like, that felt so good. Like she was my rock for so, so long until she passed away from MS in 09. And, um, and I had so much to say, and I, I feel like I've said it. I know now that, like, my mom doesn't. There's nothing that I didn't say that I should have said before she passed away. You know, there's nothing I should have done. There's no reason for regret, um, which I think everybody naturally feels when they lose a loved one, especially suddenly or traumatically. Right. Always, but especially suddenly and traumatically. And they don't get that closure. And so, um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it was it was beautiful. And I didn't want to wake up. And it makes sense to me now why I didn't wake up for three days. I'm sad that it upset Carmen, but I didn't want to wake up. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't thinking about, do I want to wake up? But I had no reason. Like, man, if I was in that dark place, I was just begging for the light. And I got it. And God showed me just a glimpse of, hey, remember, life here is not the light. Life with us is the light. Life with me eternally is the light. And uh, I hope that's not outside the bounds of this this podcast to talk about faith that way. But um, I've always believed in God. Um, I've always uh, I've always known and, and never had a doubt. I mean, I mad at God throughout my life. Um, but I, 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 uh, I know now. It's not faith in something unknown, I guess. Wow. Yeah. So one fun story that I heard, that <clears throat> something about an uncle and the way he laughed. Oh, yeah, this is... So I've never met the, the, my uncle. Uh, it was my, on my dad's side, their brother, and uh, he had committed suicide... Um, I'm very close with Taylor, uh, his daughter, uh, is our oldest cousin out of 40-something cousins. And um, I've never met him before. And I didn't know who he was at the table. And I was talking to my Uncle David, who's my godfather, I'm Catholic, and, and, uh, and I was talking to my Uncle David and telling him kind of what I experienced. And, and he's like, and who else was there? And who else was there? I was like, there was this one guy there. I have no idea who he was, but he had this obnoxious laugh like so obnoxious and and immediately the phone just went silent the phone went silent and i said are you still there and he said thank you that was my brother laughing at that table and i described the way he looked and he's i've never seen pictures of him like i i we had a big extended family, like seven aunts and uncles, and I just never met him. You know, I didn't know him. And, um, and that, I, that wasn't the solidifying factor for me for what I experienced. But it was for my uncle. <laughs> it was for my uncle and, uh, and for my aunts and uncles. Yeah. Yeah, well. <clears throat> it meant a lot because he committed suicide. Exactly. Exactly. I'm sure there are people that are listening to this that are going to feel so relieved. I hope. My hope and prayer for today was that yourself, anyone who may follow your podcast, and myself take something away. Yeah. So what do you want to leave everybody with? Live every day to the fullest. Pay attention to the people in your tribe. And when I say tribe, I'm not saying family. Your family is your family. They're important. Your tribe is the people you choose to spend the most time with. Life's short, right? Life's short. And, and pay attention to how you feel when you leave conversations with a brother, sister, an uncle, a cousin, whoever, friend. Um, and, and if they leave you worse off every time, and when you started the conversation, my recommendation to myself, and or the recommendation made to me was to minimize the amount of time. And when I spent that time, 
that it wasn't going to affect me in a negative way and then I was going to have to go do something else and it was going to affect that negatively in my life. Um, live a day, every day to the fullest. Pay attention to your tribe. And um, those key relationships in life, don't, don't take them for granted. Don't let making money get in the way. Don't let anything get in the way. Pride, being right. Would you rather be right or happy? Happy. <laughs> because I tell you what, being right is what ruins most relationships. Needing to be right. And a lot of times it's both sides. And I've been there. I'm saying me, right? I've been there. I needed to be right at times in my past. And I still today, I have to keep it in check. But that would be my advice. Live every day to the fullest. Get up in the morning and I'll tell you my first three gratitudes every day. Thank you for waking me up. Thank you for the air that I breathe and the lungs to breathe it. And for my senses, the use of my senses and all my appendages to experience your world and serve you. And that's my top three gratitudes every day. And, um, and I'm guilty of not writing them every day, and I feel it. So write them down. Write those gratitudes down. Take five minutes. Five gratitudes go. That okay. would be the little bit I would leave. Well, I can't thank you enough for no, opening you. up your heart and sharing with everybody. Um, whoo we Thank you. I love you, man. I love you, too. It's not a handshake. It's a hug. But yeah, we'll do that. It's a table hug. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much.